So without further ado, my name is Sarah Johnson. I work as an independent contractor for the Wilderness Workshop and am grateful to have you all here this evening and welcome you to this Third Street Center for the 2020 Naturalist Nights. Tonight is our third week of a 10-week series of free, amazing, awesome talks that we get to bring to all these incredible people to the valley. And the we that does this is the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies, the Wilderness Workshop, and the Roaring Fork Audubon um, folks. And so together, we are able to make this happen along with a, a significant number of sponsors who we will mention more in a moment. So these happen, this is one of a, this series, and this series happens on Wednesday nights at six o'clock here in Carbondale at the Third Street Center, but also then will happen again tomorrow in Aspen at six o'clock at Hallam Lake. And they also all get put on social media in video format. And so if you're ever interested in what's going on, you can log into either the Wilderness Workshop or the ACES um, YouTube channels or websites and find libraries and endless miles and miles and miles of video of, from Naturalist Night from years past. So if you're ever sick on the couch and you want to watch Naturalist Nights, you can. Or if you like what you see and you want to share with a friend, feel free to look for this. Tonight's presentation will be on the internet by, by the weekend. So you can find that and then share that. Before we get any further, um, this year I've always been, I've been trying to Make sure we do an, a land acknowledgement at the beginning of each of our evenings. So I want to respectfully acknowledge this place where we are today, in this Roaring Fork watershed near the confluence of the Crystal and Roaring Fork rivers. It is here that the Ute people stewarded this landscape throughout the generations. I think it's important that we rem remember where we are and who came before us. So our, I mentioned the sponsors. Tonight, our special shout out to our um, Featured sponsor is to Craig Ward, Craig Ward of Aspen Snowmass Sotheby's. Um, him and along with about 20 other sponsors, that slide should change at some point, um, will show us all the sponsors. So uh, if Craig is in the room or if any of you happen to be sponsors who are in the room, I just a, a great big thank you. And all the cookies tonight are from Village Smithy. So I just like to give all of our sponsors a big round of applause to make this free for all of you. Maybe I can make it. Ah, oh, there we go. There they are. So as I said, Grassroots films these things. We also, um, it's really helpful to us to have a, a list of who is here. So please make sure you sign in at the door. Even if you've come week after week, we still appreciate having that week after week. We also can offer continuing education credit for educators. So if you are an educator or you know one, um, have them come and fill out the special clipboard that's back there and we give credit certificates of hours and they helps them with their teacher licenses or any other kind of licenses. Um, so before I tell you more about tonight, next week we're going to have a redo from last year. Um, you might remember that Liz Schnackerberg from the US Forest Service was scheduled to come and talk about the fire from the Lake Christine fire from a hydrological perspective and she couldn't come because the government shut down. So she's coming, <laughs> she's coming next week. And she, the, her talk, so she's a water, a water she's, a, um, she's a geomorphologist, I'm pretty cer certain. She'll be here next week with her presentation titled Maintaining Catchments, Not Watersheds, The Effects of Wildfire. So hopefully you'll come back and we'll learn from her. And she was the person on the bear team on that fire. So there's not a better person to have tell us all about it. So tonight, we are going to be exploring this elk research. And um, just for fun, we'll make sure you have the title up there. And also, the Wilderness Workshop works a lot on um, keeping habitat intact. And so tonight, our speaker also matches up really well with one of our projects. And so I want to tell you a bit about that project so that you have a chance to put this all in context and figure out a way that you can also contribute um, to protecting habitat. So the Berlamont Estates project over in the Eagle Valley proposes to build a new paved 26 foot wide road across 4.2 miles of public land outside of Edwards to accommodate a luxury housing development on an inholding 
that's surrounded by national forest. The road would zigzag through the heart of some of the best remaining deer and elk winter range in the Eagle Valley, placing added pressure on those animals, which are already experiencing steep population declines due to overdevelopment of their habitat. Wilderness Workshop is leading advocacy efforts alongside the local community, which have, has expressed widespread outrage and opposition to the project. So tonight, please see Alicia. She's somewhere, she's got back there by those tables. And she has some clipboards, of course. And she would love for you to, um, if you feel so inclined, to sign the petition, which already has surpassed 4,000 signatures to help protect this habitat, this critical winter habitat. So keep that in mind as you're leaving. So tonight, we have Paul Milhauser from Rocky Mountain Wild speaking on his recent research that happened right here in the Roaring Fork Valley, as well as in the Eagle Valley. And so it's, again, no, what better person than somebody who's been studying our val the specific location. So he is a landscape ecologist and GIS specialist for Rocky Mountain Wild, whose research focuses on the impact of human development on wildlife. The Rocky Mountains are his primary research area, but he has also worked on studies in, of Africa and Mongolia. He recently received his Master's of Geographic Information Systems from Penn State, and it, in an apparent case of taking his work home with him, he and his wife are the proud caretakers of a dog, two three-legged cats, three tortoises, two cats, a gecko, a tengu, five chickens, and two daughters. <laughs> Paul enjoys skiing, running, and of course traveling with his family, and he was kind enough to travel here from Denver, and so we'll give him the stage and let him share with us what he has learned in this most recent research. So. All right, well, thank you all for coming out tonight, and uh, now that I hear that it's a free event, I know why the crowd's so big, so... I don't, that, that keeps my ego from getting too big. Um, but in all seriousness, uh, it's great to be here talking to a sort of general public audience, albeit one that I think is probably well-educated, intelligent, and actually pretty informed about some of the things I'll be talking about tonight. So, um, so that's a treat for me, because I'm usually speaking to professional conferences or agency staff, and I really have to put up a lot of bar graphs and scatter plots and things that I know you don't want to see, and I don't really want to see them either. Um, so I'll, keep, I'll try to keep it light on that stuff. Um, I will put in a plug for my employer, Rocky Mountain Wild. Uh, we do a lot of work uh, in this region, all throughout the Southern Rockies, focused on Colorado. And a lot of it is looking at oil and gas proposed leases on federal lands and seeing where they conflict with wildlife values or with endangered species habitat and uh, try to push back on that. And just as importantly, we provide the data that we come up with to other nonprofits, like Wilderness Workshop, for example, to help empower them to also push back against those things. So uh, it's a great organization. And most recently, one of the things we've been working on is getting a wildlife crossing structure built over I-70 at Vail Pass. And some of you may have heard about that. And we've actually now got it to the stage where plans are being drawn up. We're working with a bunch of partners. It's not just us, but it's, uh, it's one of our uh, big focuses right now. And in the back of the room, there's some citizen science projects that we do, um, some of them right here in White River National Forest, and we would love to have help, so uh, take a look at those. Um, all right, enough of the plugs. Um, so my research was actually both my master's thesis and a work project for Rocky Mountain Wild, um, and I got some sponsorship from Patagonia as well, thanks to them. I see a lot of Patagonia outfits here, so thank you. Uh, my research is really focused on what's happening to elk in this valley and Eagle Valley over the last 40 years. And I think it's a story that is not going to come as a surprise to anyone here. Um, really, the, let's see if I put the right. Really, the, um, the issue is the population's been going down, a lot of possible reasons. Everyone, I think, thinks they have the reason, but there's been limited sort of scientific research on what's really driving it. So, I decided that that would be a good topic. A bunch of people uh, at work mentioned it, um, a number of other things. And actually, recently, I uh, worked with Peter Hart of Wilderness Workshop on that Burlamont Estates project that Sarah just referred to. So uh, it's really especially nice to be up here. Um, and this is the first time I've given this presentation, so bear with me if I have to check my notes occasionally. I hate to do that, but I don't want to miss anything good. Um, 
So uh, the first thing I want to do actually was uh, say, I'm always interested in the kind of crowd that's here. Um, and I said, you know, I'm usually presenting to professional and agency crowds. I just want, I'm just curious, are, are there any agency staff members here? I, I'd love it if there are. Can't see. Anybody? Not too much, okay. Uh, the other thing I always want to know is, are there any hunters present? Because that would be really nice. Hunters. Yes, excellent. Um, I think uh, hunters have a really unique perspective on what's going on in the forest and with elk, and I think that's, and, and talking to hunters has, has been really valuable in informing my research, so I'm, I'm glad to see uh, that you folks are present, too. Um, all right, so the next question is, I want to know how many people in this room have lived in this area for at least five years? Okay, well, that's pretty good. How many, keep, oh, keep, keep them up, keep them up. Uh, how many, uh, keep them up if you've been here for 10 years or more? 20? 30? Yeah, okay. That's, that's, uh, that's interesting. Now, how many of you, and I, I think it's going to be almost all of you, uh, use White River National Forest for recreation? And that includes ski areas. Yeah. And how many of you think there are more people using them today than there were 20 years ago? <laughs> uh, actually, is there anyone who doesn't think that? Because I, I really want to really understand that. No. Um, well, that's, that's about what I expected. So we've got a savvy crowd here. That's helpful. Um, so yeah, so I, 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 it was suggested to me that I look into this, you know, news stories like this were popping up, and so I, I decided to, you know, actually look at uh, what CPW, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, uh, has uh, in hard data on elk in this area, uh, talk to staff there at the Forest Service, and uh, to a few hunters, and just uh, other folks who work in conservation up here, and a few things were clear. Um, the elk population really has dropped by about 50% in the last 20 years. Um, it's, uh, you know, and there hasn't been big increases in hunting or other obvious causes that, that we can say, ah, oh, that's what it was. So there really is something going on. Um, and clearly, just a quick look at the data says there's been a lot of development going on in that time period. Um, and the other thing I, I would say is it's, it's really, it's really no one cause that everyone agrees on. It, has, it seems like most people anecdotally think it's got something to do with there being too many people. Um, but exactly how you measure that and how that's working, no one had a great idea, and certainly there wasn't any uh, analysis that had been done that, that would prove that scientifically. Because while I think you know, we all might have an idea of what's happening, if you want to change policy at agencies, they want data. They, they really like science. Um, and um, coincidentally, that's what I do for a living, so that works out really well. Um, let's see here. All right, well, why do elk matter anyway? Um, actually, that guy looks like he's kind of mad I'm even asking the question. Of course they matter. Uh, well, I think most people here um, probably value elk uh, just for elk's sake, because they're beautiful animals, they're part of the ecosystem up here, kind of iconic wildlife, and I think this is probably an audience of nature lovers, and that's enough. Uh, that's not enough for government agencies, and it's not enough for a lot of other people. Um, so it's good to remember that if elk went away, there would be a huge economic effect on this area. Um, elk contribute tens of millions of dollars, literally, to the local economy, just directly through hunting-related activities. And then beyond that, you know, the sort of ecosystem they represent, they're kind of a keystone species, if you will, um, you know, generates tens of millions more in terms of recreation dollars uh, being spent up here. Um, you know, this is a place where people really want to be, and if we, you know, the wilderness uh, is devalued, it's, it's, it's not going to be the same place. So there's definitely something going on, and there's a need to figure out what. So here's a little road map uh, for my talk. Uh, first, this, you know, the study area, that's going to be pretty easy for this crowd, um, since we're like, standing in it. Um, understanding elk population change. You know, what, do, what is elk growth rate like if there aren't people around, or there aren't external factors that are driving it down? Uh, and what might be the, the human factors that are affecting it um, by effects in the landscape? Uh, then. I explain how I make a model that tries to explain what's going on. 
Um, and that's a, quite a process. Uh, next, I tell you what I learned and what I didn't learn from making the model. And, and finally, I'll, I'll try to look a little bit forward into the future and uh, maybe have some suggestions that uh, we can all do to uh, give the elk a little help, because they could use it. All right, so we're going to start off with the study area. Um, uh, so I think everyone here is familiar with this general region of Colorado. So let's zoom in a little bit. There we go. So what you're looking at is uh, a map of the Eagle and Roaring Fork Valleys. Um, so you can see they, they, they both run through a lot of national forest land, uh, also a lot of private land along the river valleys. Um, and Colorado Parks and Wildlife keeps pretty careful track of the elk here. Um, so there's a data analysis unit E15 and E16. Um, they're separated by the Roaring Fork River Valley. And each one of those corresponds roughly to the entire uh, range of a single elk herd. Um, now, it's a, these are big herds, and they, they split up into smaller groups during a lot of the year. But roughly, it's a self-contained unit, um, and you can look at it that way. So for my study, I just um, kind of glommed those two together. I did do a little initial research to make sure that what was going on in the two was comparable, so I wasn't sort of losing anything important that way. Um, and, and they've experienced sort of similar uh, kinds of trends, so uh, that's, that's not really a problem. Well, now we need to understand how elk population change works. Um, you know, what, what causes growth, what lessens growth, um, and what about those things might be changing, and you know, how, how might we play into that? So here is one of the very few graphs I will be showing you, and I forbid you from reading any numbers because they don't matter. Oops, don't tell anyone at the scientific conference. Um, but what you can see is this is just from 1981 up until almost the present. And this is the elk population in the two valleys. So you can see, starting in the 80s, really, really rapid increase. Um, in 10 years, the population more than doubled. And it gets up here around 20,000. It kind of hits a plateau for about 10 years. And then since then, it's pretty much a steady decline up until actually the last two years that we have data for, um, when the population has actually bumped up a little bit. It's, uh, it's on a little early to tell if that's uh, a, a real trend starting or if that's just um, kind of a fluke. Uh, we'll, we'll have to see. I'm, I'm not too optimistic, but um, I would love to be proved wrong. All right, so what, what is the natural growth rate of elk like? Um, well, elk, you know, they reproduce once a year. Uh, Every adult cow uh, is capable of having a calf, um, usually just one calf. Um, and they actually typically have a pretty good survival rate that first year, um, depending on what the weather's like and predation and things like that. But, but they do pretty well. So you know, elk, an elk herd can grow 20% a year if there's not anything really constraining it. Um, so in general, they, they, can, you know, they can take a hit and bounce back pretty well. Uh, and, here are some of the things that might cause uh, a decline in the population. I don't think any of those are too surprising. Um, obviously, predation is one of the factors I thought about in this study. And the short version of uh, that is there isn't great data on how that's changed over time. Uh, and there isn't, anecdotally, uh, and from what evidence there is, enough change in that to explain the kind of population decline we're looking at. I'm certainly not saying it might not have an effect. I'm just saying it's not big enough to really produce what we've been seeing. So unfortunately, I can't get as far into that as I'd like to. Uh, disease, a similar story, but the data is a little better. Um, chronic wasting disease is a huge problem for elk in many areas. It hasn't been such a huge problem in these two valleys, and hopefully it stays that way. Um, so again, I can't really analyze it very well, but I'm not too worried about that, because I, I don't think it's driving it. Um, obviously, starvation is a, is a huge issue for elk if there's a severe winter. Um, that's maybe one of the factors I think that's most obvious to people. If, you, if, if you've been here during a hard winter, you know, you'll, you'll, see, you'll see starving elk. Um, and it's not, it's not very nice to see. And you know, it's, it's in part because they need access to winter habitat um, where it's, there's still grass and other forage that's reachable 
in the wintertime, and if they can't get that and it's a bad winter, they're really in trouble. Uh, strangely enough, elk population itself is a limiting factor on elk population. Um, I think probably people are familiar with the concept of carrying capacity, which is basically just how many animals of a species the landscape can tolerate before the species starts experiencing harm or the overall environment starts experiencing harm. And given that uh, we just saw that elk had a population in these two valleys of about 20,000 for 10 years, I think it's a fair estimate that that's around what the uh, carrying capacity was, at least at that time. Now, as the elk population rises up towards that level, the growth rate trends down uh, automatically. It's, there's more stress on the animals, there's less food available, they're less likely to reproduce successfully. So it's a little bit of a self-managing thing. Um, so, so definitely, once you get to higher populations, you don't expect to see as rapid growth. And you know, finally, uh, there's human impacts. Um, and if, I, if you'll indulge me, I would ask all of you to maybe turn to a neighbor, ideally someone you haven't met before, and just brainstorm for maybe a minute or two uh, about what you think the human impacts are. And some of them will be easy, but some of them maybe not. Uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll ask for a few answers. So, uh, uh, let me see, I'll, I'll start the clock. Uh, so, so, so introduce yourselves. Oh, I, I, I'm, oh, at the moment I am, sorry. Oh, okay, over more? Will do. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right, I, if I could ask you to wrap it up um, and uh, see, what, see what you guys have come up with. Um, let's see, I can't see very well, so anyone raise, raise, it, raise their hand if they think they might have uh, a good thought. Or hey, you, sir. For sure. Anyone else? Right there. Development of valley floors, yes. Good idea. Oh. Noise. I like that one. I'm sorry to say it, but mountain biking. <laughs> no comment. Okay. Um, over. Great. Um, anyone else want to venture a guess? Hello. <clears throat> How about the change of the migratory paths? Oh, here we go. Who's Very good. Elk fences. Elk fences all right, that's, these, these are all interesting, interesting uh, ideas. Any type of uh, fragmentation, land fragmentation. Sure. Okay. I, well, you guys are good. Um, I'm, I'm going home. You guys, <laughs> you guys have this figured out. Well, um, Susie adds dogs. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, 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 
more on that later, actually, if I, if I think to. And remind me at the end if I didn't. Um, well, here, here are the general categories that I came up with. And I, th I think pretty much everything uh, you folks mentioned can be squeezed into one of these categories, more or less. Um, first, uh, this didn't come up, but wildlife vehicle collisions certainly play some role. Not a big one, not one that changed too much over time, but, but it's, it's a, real, a real effect. Um, you also have to look at hunting, of course, um, because, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty direct cause of death. Um, on, and, and the good thing is we have really good data on hunting from CPW. We, we know how many elk are killed every year, and not just how many, what, what sexes of elk, what age status, that's really good information that really helps the analysis. Um, now, uh, I don't want to get political about this with hunting, but actually I don't think hunting is the primary force. It just hasn't changed enough in terms of the volume to explain this kind of decline. That's not to say it can't be part of the picture, but there's no way that uh, just the kind of ongoing hunting at levels that haven't changed that much is, is going to affect this big a change. So, Really, my theory is um, it's two kinds of changes at work. Um, one is disturbance from recreational activity, which I think s several folks uh, said some things relevant. You, said, you mentioned noise, for example, um, and uh, mountain bikes. Um, those are just examples of the kind of human activity that goes on in the forest. And again, anecdotally, we think more than ever. Uh, here's the problem. We don't know. Uh, I mean, I think we all believe it. Uh, and I, I think we're right, but the Forest Service keeps essentially no data on how many people use the forest, what parts of the forest they use, what kind of activity they're doing, because obviously the effect of a hiker versus an ATVer is going to be different, but that, that information isn't there, and that's a huge gap, uh, and I'll talk more about that later, and it's, it's one we need to fill, though, for sure. So given that we, um, either these things aren't driving it, uh, or we don't have the kind of data we'd like, uh, w what else do we have to look at from human activity? And that's essentially landscape change, so habitat fragmentation, um, and also loss of landscape connectivity, which are kind of related concepts, and, uh, and they both came up in terms of what's the effect of wildlife fencing, um, and what's the effect of development. And those are, those are really you know, the things that I started to get interested in, because I, I can see these are both things that have changed a lot over recent decades. And, and so that starts to look like something that could be involved here. So let's go back to that delightful graph just for a minute. And what you'll see is this line is development. And it, it's basically the number of square feet of construction in existence throughout the whole study area. So it's, it's a rough measure. But I think what you'll see is kind of interesting. Um, even during the 80s uh, and into the 90s, when the elk population was growing and then stayed really high, development was really taking off too. Uh, it didn't seem to have any effect. And then the lines sort of cross here. Um, it's just not clear what's going on. It's certainly not some one-to-one uh, -one correspondence that we can say, aha, you know, you know, five points of development equals you know, 100 elk fewer. It's not, it's not that kind of relationship, but it, it, that is suggestive that something might be going on. Um, now, there is some interesting things to look at here when we think about, well, why that sudden decrease um, and that ongoing downward trend? Well, around this time, the folks at CPW, um, I think probably pretty reasonably said, you know, 20,000 is an awfully high population here. We're going to have a major starvation event if there's a really bad winter. No one wants that. Let's increase the hunting licenses a little bit and, you know, bring the population down just a bit, and we'll be in a better position. So that's what they did. Um, and what they found was, well, the population responded uh, much more rapidly than they thought it would. They, they weren't expecting anywhere near that fast to decline, um, so they backed off. They just, you know, it was maybe not even five years. Um, they said, wait, wait, we can't do this anymore. Uh, and, you know, for that first little period there, things kind of stabilized like you would expect. Um, and I think they probably thought, oh, we're good now. Nope. Kept going. Um, and they didn't increase the hunting licenses, so hunting may have been involved up here, 
but it's not driving all of this. So um, I think we still need to factor in hunting, but we, we also need to look for more. All right, well, let's look at how humans uh, might affect elk mortality. Um, you know, we talked about habitat fragmentation and loss of connectivity. Um, and, you know, this is meaning not just less habitat, but less accessible habitat of what's remaining. Uh, and so that, that really um, comes at you in a number of ways. But before we can get too deep into it, um, we really need to understand what we mean when we say habitat, which I think everyone here has a pretty good dictionary definition, at least, of, of habitat in their minds, and some better than that. Um, but let's talk about it as it really applies to elk. Um, in general, habitat is just a place where a species conducts its key life activities, living, feeding, reproducing. Um, that's, that's what I think what we all probably learned in high school biology class, uh, and that's true, um, but with a lot of animals, uh, elk included, you have to recognize they need more than one type of habitat, uh, and they might need different habitats at different types of year, times of year. So, for example, elk uh, need land that's going to be suitable for feeding in wintertime. They also need land that is good for calving, uh, and they also need land that's good just for fattening up in the summer and early fall. Um, now, those areas will overlap, but they are somewhat distinct areas, and the elk need access to all of them if they're going to be successful. The other um, issue is what's the quality of that habitat? Uh, lots of areas that uh, are habitat and might look exactly the same if you didn't look too closely, well, they're actually different. Um, this one has you know, a better array of edible plants on it for elk. It looks very similar to another area that's pretty good, but this one's much better. Uh, and also, these patches of habitat differ in size. Um, even, even naturally, they differ in size. And bigger ones, all else being equal, are better. They, they can support more elk, uh, and they have more resilience. And finally, um, what about connections uh, between these habitats? Um, and this is sort of getting at what some folks said here. Uh, as habitat patches get smaller, which is something that we're certainly causing, uh, the connections between them become ever more important. Uh, you can compensate a little bit by improving those connections. Uh, unfortunately, as we'll see, that's the, the things that cause fragmentation also tend to hurt connectivity. So we're, we're in a little bit of a bind. So how does habitat fragmentation actually affect elk? Um, what is sort of the cause and effect here? Um, all right, well, let's look at what causes it. Um, there's a lot of causes. Um, first of all, I think, you know, we think of habitat fragmentation as being uh, an artificial human-caused problem, but actually natural landscapes are fragmented. Uh, it's totally normal. That's the reason why, even before we were here, all these species migrated. Uh, and you can see there are lots of obstacles, um, both to, to movement between areas and, they're car and carving them up. So it could be a river, it could be steep cliffs. Um, it can even be just the, the natural um, transition from a grassland area to a forested area. For some species, that's, that makes a huge difference. The elk you know, are pretty mobile, so not so much. Um, of course, there's lots of artificial ones. Uh, and the ones I think we think of most are this kind of development, where a big patch is carved out, roads are put in, houses are built. Um, that's really, uh, I think, a classic example. But there's, there's lots of other ways it can happen. Uh, even agricultural activities um, and the fencing that's associated with them, or wildlife fencing, um, uh, can have a, a really strong effect that way. And yes, I know that is a deer and not an elk. <laughs> I couldn't find a good elk photo with a fence. I know somebody was going to trip me up on that on the questions later. I'm just cutting you off. Um, now, this is actually my, my, uh, my favorite one. Um, Roads, uh, okay, I, I mean, I think at some level we understand that roads carve up habitat and cause fragmentation, but hey, that elk's, that elk's crossing the road. Um, I'm pretty sure people here see elks along the roads all the time, uh, even in towns. I mean, gosh, you look at Estes Park, um, they're overrun with elk. Uh, so I guess those elk are doing fine. Well, it's not so simple. Uh, fragmentation, unless you've got a fence or I-70, it's not a black and white kind of situation. It's more of a continuum. So yeah, absolutely, an elk might cross this road if that's what it needs to do to get to the habitat it needs to access. 
but it's not enjoying it. It would really rather not. Um, studies have shown that elk in particular um, will avoid an area around a road or trail, sort of depending on how big and busy it is, um, minimum of 100 yards on either side of it, uh, up to at least half a mile if it's a, a larger road. So it, it really does have an effect. It's not to say they won't go there, but they will try to avoid it. When they are there, uh, they're in a bind because they have to expend the energy to move, um, but they're also not feeding as they're moving, as they normally would be. Uh, and also, they're under a lot of stress. They are hyper alert in these situations. Uh, elk don't tend to run as much as deer do in these situations, but that doesn't mean they're not feeling it. Um, a lot of uh, studies have shown uh, that their stress hormones in situations like this are through the roof. And that means they actually need more food because they're burning more energy. So it's really hitting them at both ends there. Um, and so don't be fooled when you see them along the roads. It doesn't mean there's no effect. All right. Oh, wow, those colors came out differently. Um, so here you have um, uh, that map of the area I showed you before. Uh, and it's divided into seasonal habitat zones. And just to keep it simple, um, here along the valleys, that blue, the various shades of blue, are different kinds of winter habitat. And you can certainly see it, it tends to concentrate along those valleys, because um, obviously they're, they're lower elevation, um, better access to food in the wintertime. There are also some um, magenta areas that don't show up quite as well uh, in this color scheme. Um, and those are uh, calving areas. They're so called production areas uh, on the map. But that's that's the CPW term. Um, and those are also you know, thought to be limiting factors. Those are the two things that an elk biologist would tell you tend to limit elk population. So let's look ahead. And this is what it looked like in 1990. Uh, I took all the roads and trails that were in existence then, and I made them white, and I assigned a thickness based on you know, a thin line for a trail up to a thick line for I-70, and sort of scaled in between. And you can see already, it's it's pretty fragmented, especially it's really concentrated in that winter habitat and the river valleys. Um, that's, uh, that's pretty striking uh, to me. Um, obviously, you know, this is imprecise art, but I think it gives you an idea of what's going on. And here's what it looked like in 2018. Uh, just to kind of go back and forth a little bit just to show you. Um, so you didn't didn't see a lot of expansion into new areas. You saw existing areas getting dense. And I think that's because most of the land that was still available was actually already in the National Forest where it's not likely to get developed. So uh, people were just filling in everywhere they could. Now, so if we, if we kind of go back and forth. Ah, there we go. So here's sort of uh, without human interference. And here's what it looks like today. Uh, you can really appreciate that the winter habitat and the production areas especially really took a big hit. Um, and that's, that's, that's got to have an impact. That's making that, that critical habitat harder to access. So, but how do we measure that? Um, it's great to have those visualizations, but I need something that gives me numbers so I can analyze it. Um, it turns out uh, our good friends at Zillow um, in exchange for invading everyone's privacy a little bit, have built up an amazing database. Basically, they've digitized all of the records from every county land recorder's office in the entire country from 1810 up to today. And some really smart scientists at CU took that data and analyzed it, massaged it, worked magic on it, and they came up with a score of they call the, you know, the built-up intensity. And it's really just an arbitrary number based on how many square feet of development there are in every 250 meter by 250 meter square in the entire country. And that's nice. It's really geographically specific. And that means, as a result, uh, I can know for sure, is this development that's occurring in the study area or not? Uh, so that's really helpful. Uh, it's done every five years. So that gives me a lot of insight uh, in a, and in a way that I can actually use to compare to other things. So here's my hypothesis after all this thinking and, and initial research. Human development um, and the habitat fragmentation it causes is having an effect that's driving down the population growth rate for elk. 
So that's what I set out to prove, either false, or true or false. Either way, it would be interesting. It would be a lot better if it were true because um, then I could get more funding. Um, <laughs> all right, well, how do we do that? Um, we make a model, um, and basically that involves taking all of these different possible variables that could be affecting elk population and checking them against changes in elk population, against changes in each other, and every possible combination I could come up with and somehow try to make sense of that. Um, that is where statistics becomes my friend. All right, don't panic. This is a messy looking chart, but it's just a thought experiment I did, because I, I, I want to understand what are the possible factors and how might they be operating. So really quick, these are all the things that uh, cause mortality, and these are all the things that affect what the birth rate is. Uh, and this, this, and this are in red, believe it or not, and they indicate human impacts. And you know, these are ones that I, I, I feel like I understood, so hunting, obviously. Um, the human impact on the landscape makes it harder to get to that, that key seasonal habitat. Um, it also makes it hard to get to calving areas, um, and that's going to hurt the birth rate. So that all seemed pretty straightforward. Um, now, how do I make a model that incorporates all those ideas? Well, it's all about the data, right? So I have great data on elk population, herd structure, hunting from 1981 you know, up to 2018. That's awesome. Um, I've got that built-up intensity measure, uh, and that gives me a good measure of fragmentation across the whole period. Normally, I'd use other methods that are sort of more commonly used, but I didn't have data at the sort of time frequency I needed to make that work. So this was really helpful. Uh, and then finally, I looked at things uh, that also might be affecting it. Snow, total precipitation, uh, what's the health of the vegetation that year? Um, and I got all of those uh, through both sort of weather records and also uh, in the case of the, the vegetation, I actually used satellite data on uh, how much photosynthesis was going on. There's some, some pretty neat products that um, USGS provides free of charge, um, so I use those. Um, so, all right, now I'm ready to model. Um, so the data was a little challenging, right? It, it, you know, some things are every year, some things are every five years, some things are only part of the period. Um, so actually, what I really did more than extrapolate was interpolate, uh, and again, wave my wand uh, and use statistics to, to sort of make up for these problems. Um, so now we're going to go into the statistics fun and exciting workshop. Just kidding, we're not going to do that. Um, I don't think there's anyone, well, there's very few people who find it fun and exciting. I mean, it, they're interesting and they're useful, but they're not fun and exciting, come on. All right, well now um, we're going to look at results. You know, I took all of that data, I fed it into some statistical software, and it runs every possible combination of every cause, um, both with each other to look for correlations among them, how it correlates with elk population, and it comes up with a score as to which ones seem to be the most predictive. Um, now some of those, when you look at them closely, defy common sense or um, contradict things that we know about elk behavior, and, and so I have to rule those ones out. So there is something for me to do. Uh, it's, not just, it's not just the computer. Um, and then once I have that, you know, I start delving into the best ones and sort of see why they're the best and you know, what I really think uh, we can learn from those ones. Um, so if you'll recall the hypothesis, um, let's, let's see what happens. All right, so when I considered the whole uh, time period for which I had data that I could do this with, um, 1981 to 2018 approximately, uh, I got an interesting result. It was actually more interesting than I thought it would be, and that's not always how it works. Um, all you needed to predict the following year's elk population growth was the current year's total elk population and the total development at that time. Uh, two factors, that's surprising. Um, and even more surprising is this predicts about 70% of the variation in that population growth number. Um, which, you know, if you're thinking batting averages is really good, um, but uh, in the case of something like an, a complex ecosystem study, 
it's, it's still quite high. So that, that's encouraging. Um, I, I felt like, okay, I, I'm definitely on to something here. Um, and that's good news. So, ooh, and you really can't see this one. Well, hypothesis confirmed. Um, thank you and good night. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, what's really going on, though, it's great to know that these things predict that. That's interesting. But unless we know how they predict it and why they predict it, it's not of much use to wildlife managers and agency staff who are trying to figure out what to do to make conditions better for elk. Um, it's, it's a start, but it's really just a start. Um, and, you know, I have to think about what's going on in that remaining 30%, too. I mean, I think we are all pretty confident that things like predation and hunting, um, wildlife vehicle collisions, weather, weather didn't turn out to be a factor, well, we know they all have an impact. I mean, that's obvious. So they could be in that 30% because they just don't show up in a way that statistics finds very easily. Um, it's also possible that they don't affect the change in growth rate from year to year so much, except maybe weather. Um, what they do is they sort of set the baseline of what the growth rate's going to be. Um, and these other factors explain how it kind of bounces in between the bottom and the upper end of that range. So, so uh, again, I, I kind of find myself asking more questions than I'm answering. Uh, and again, that means continued funding, so good. Um, when I narrowed it down to 2001 to 2017, um, because it seemed like something changed around 2000 maybe, uh, and also I had more data available that I could look at, more specific data, um, I got a different model. Um, now, it's, it's got some of the same things, right? It's got two of the same. Um, the number of cows killed in hunting um, now starts to show up as an effect. Um, I don't think that's surprising. Uh, what's surprising is it didn't show up earlier, uh, but it's, it's clearly part of the picture now. Um, now, summer habitat fragmentation. I, I now have a, the data that I can sort of distinguish how the fragmentation occurs in different kinds of habitat. Um, that's surprising, because we talked earlier, it's winter habitat and calving area habitat that's critical to elk survival. So what's going on here? Well, I, I have a theory. Um, I think that by 2000, the winter habitat was about as fragmented as it can be. <laughs> um, don't get me wrong, there's still some left that's in danger of being fragmented, and we need to protect that. It, it's critical, but at this point, the development started turning into areas um, that were traditionally summer habitat. Uh, and so when the elk already aren't getting the winter habitat they need, that summer habitat becomes more critical. Because if they can't feed well during the winter, they sure as heck had better bulk up during the summer and fall, uh, or, or they're going to be out of luck. So that becomes a limiting factor. And then sort of finally, oh, and you can't see it very well, the number of hunting licenses issued um, comes as a factor. That's really interesting, because it's just the number issued. That is completely separate from how many elk uh, of what age, what sex, uh, are killed in the hunt. It's just something about there being more hunters in the woods that year. Well, that's thought-provoking. Um, I mean, we, I think we all appreciate that human presence you know, has an effect on wildlife, but this is starting to get at that. Um, and this makes me really wish we had that recreation data. Because if you think of, I mean, the number of hunters in the woods certainly varies, but it hasn't changed substantially over the years, um, the number of, as measured by the number of licenses issued. Um, so what about more snowmobilers, more mountain bikers? You know, these activities are going on year-round now. It's not just part of the year. And there's lots of people more than ever. So, um, you know, this model c covers about 80% of what's going on. So that's, that's a substantial improvement. Um, but we're still missing some key pieces that we'd really like to get a, a better idea of. So here's what the, my model looked like before I did this analysis. Now, after, you can see uh, other human impacts, um, recreation, essentially, uh, affecting access to seasonal habitat, basically because there's more people there, uh, the elk don't want to be there. Um, and similarly, uh, it makes uh, calving areas less accessible. But also, I think it has something to do with cow fertility or, or reproductive success more broadly. Um, I think what's really been driving things down is actually that low growth rate. Um, so let's see how that might work. 
So, th so the measure that um, a lot of scientists use, CPW uses, um, to sort of evaluate reproductive success is the number of calves per cow. Um, that's actually measured right about this time of year after the hunt. And basically, um, you know, the highest ratio you're going to get, because uh, cows don't, cow elk don't have twins essentially ever, um, is one. So, so one means every adult cow elk has a calf. Well, that's going to cause stupendous growth. But of course, it never happens because we're living in the real world. Um, and in fact, when I looked at what the, uh, that ratio was um, during the study period, it ranged from uh, about one in four cow elk having calves, which means population decline, uh, up to two calves for every three elk. Um, and if you like to think uh, decimally, that's sort of a 0.25 ratio up to a, around a 0.65 ratio. Uh, and so that's a big difference. You know, one end of that is robust growth, the other is population decline. Um, so we've got a measure now, and we, we know that that's part of the picture. Um, well, here's what that looks like. Um, so you'll see those yellow years uh, are years where that calf-cow relationship is below 0.48. Um, and really what I had to do was you couldn't come up with a sort of one-to-one -one ratio. Ah, you have this uh, level of calf-to-cow ratio. This will produce this level of growth. It doesn't work like that, it turns out. It's a, it's a, a threshold effect. So basically, in y years when that ratio is above 0.48, you almost always have population growth. And when it's below that rate, you almost always have decline. There are exceptions on both sides, for sure. It's not, it's not a simple thing, but it's statistically meaningful. And what's really interesting is, you know, look where all these years are uh, where that ratio is, is low. Um, so I think that's, that's telling us something. Um, you know, the conditions for uh, growth of the population uh, have not been there. And that's... That's nice when it's consistent with what we've been observing in the population, too. So, what is the effect of um, recreation? Well, I think here, you know, we now know that, yeah, that, that cow elk is totally disturbed. Look at it. It's, it's not moving. It's not feeding. It's, uh, it's under a lot of stress. Look how alert it is. Um, that's not a happy elk. Um, <laughs> so, the problem is, uh, I think, the elk population is no longer resilient. Um, now, if you jump on a trampoline um, hundreds and hundreds of times, you're going to bounce every time. But when you put another person on it, you lose a little bit of that bounce, and so on and so on. And you may wonder, how many people does it take on a trampoline before it doesn't bounce? It's five. I know that empirically because my daughter was on a trampoline with five friends, and they all bottomed out at once, and she was flung high up in the air, and she landed exactly when they were at the bottom of their arc, and she broke her leg. Um, and she reported it felt like falling on concrete. Uh, and I think that's what's happened to elk. They have been kind of putting up with all of the insults and injuries of development and human activity throughout the 80s and 90s, and finally it reached a point oh my God. where all that stretch was taken Oh my out. God, okay. So when something happens, in this case, I think it was the increase in hunting licenses, but it, if that hadn't happened, it would have been okay, a bad okay. winter. Here, film this, Shauna. Come up here, film effect. this. It's not, it's, not, here. it's not really a hunting problem. Here, here. No, no, just it's a resilience here. problem. No, 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 so, we're not going to shoot it. Bud, Give me a and break. Elk just haven't been able to bounce back from them. Their, their reproductive success is, I think, long-term changed in a way that's going to hamper any recovery. Um, let's see if I can make this happen. Uh, Elk are terrible on trampolines. Um, foxes are way better. There's some really nice fox videos. Here, film this shot. Here, film this. Here. Here. No, 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 no. That's my favorite part. I just, I just, I love that guy. Um, we're not going to shoot it. All right, let's see if we can get that next slide to come up. There we go. All right, so. So now, you know, we think, I think I've got some ideas of what's happening. I know a lot more than I knew before I did this study, for sure. So what does that mean for the future? Well, I'm not too optimistic. Um, 
elk are still facing all of these challenges they've been facing uh, the entire time, um, and worse than ever. Uh, their population has remained low for quite a long time. Little uptick, maybe that's a good sign, I hope so. Um, but really, I think they don't have the ability to bounce back. If there's another serious event, maybe a, a really hard winter, I think the population could crash. Um, now, CPW disagrees. Um, they think that the population here um, can be stable where it is. Um, uh, I hope they're right, but I think they're wrong. Um, I think they haven't taken into account all these other effects uh, from human development and recreation. Uh, now, I know their scientists are smart, and they're looking at this stuff, and they're thinking about it, and I hope the, uh, the managers and people in authority listen to their scientists, because those guys know what's going on. Um, but all is not lost. <laughs> There is still winter habitat left. There is still summer habitat left. There's still 10,000 elk between the two valleys. Uh, it, uh, we need to do something about it. But it's, it's not impossible. So what I would point to is talk to your elected officials. Uh, I know government doesn't have a good reputation these days. But I assure you, if you talk to elected officials, they will listen to you. You're their constituents, and especially the more local they are, the more likely they are to listen. And I'll tell you a, a, a secret. The county commissioners are the most important ones. Uh, they actually teamed up with us in San Miguel County to sue the BLM to stop some oil and gas leasing. Um, and I'll tell you, the judge takes notice when it's not just some you know, tree hugger group. It's the county commissioners who are the voice of the people there. So, so don't underestimate that. So talk to all of your elected officials at every level and tell them to tell the, the federal agencies, the planning boards, anyone who has uh, influence that you want this to change. Um, we need a little bit less hunting. I, I, again, I don't think it's driving it, but we need to go easy on these poor guys and you know, ask people to maybe hunt in other parts of the state for a little while. Um, not, not, not a drastic reduction, but we need a little bit, I think. Um, more seasonal closures of areas that are critical habitat. Um, really let those elk have a chance to do what they do without our interference. Um, less development. I mean, I, I think I'm, I'm preaching to the choir on that one. Um, and again, county commissioners, they have a lot to say about that. Uh, if we can slow that down, there'll be time for the elk. Um, do more research on the things that we don't understand, like recreation. Figure out how much of an effect it's having, how it's having that effect, and what we can do to make it better. I'm actually going to do some research this spring on what's happening uh, with seasonal closures of trails. Are people observing them? Do they work? Should we expand them? Um, and I'm really excited about that. And hopefully, it's just a little piece of what we need to learn, but it's a start. Um, and all that information lets us really change the long-term uh, development plans and management plans. Um, that's what needs to happen. Um, it's a hard time to do that. There's a lot of uh, polarization, but that's something I think probably everyone in this room would feel pretty comfortable with is managing this land to last for future generations. Um, so I want to thank you all for coming out and being so patient uh, with my talk that's gone too long. Uh, and again, I want to thank Rocky Mountain Wild and Patagonia uh, for their funding and just their support. And I'm going to leave that up there so you can think about what you might want to do uh, when you go home tonight. Uh, anyway, thank you all so much for coming out. And Sarah, is, are there, is there time for questions? Yeah. All right, that was fantastic. Thank you, um, Paul, for your talk. We're gonna turn on a few lights. It is seven o'clock. If you absolutely need to get up and leave, it doesn't hurt anybody's feelings. But if you'd like to stick around for questions and answers, that's great too. Somebody right here just had, okay, we'll start here. I, I, I just had a question about the, um, your, the, um, uh, the relationship between uh, the cal for the calving, for example, yeah, the success, the, the getting to the point forty-eight, yeah, you know, um, and and hunting success. Um, have you now? You've talked a lot about the ecological impacts. How about the physiological? Is there any research or any thoughts that maybe hunters are are focusing more on the healthy males and the impact of of, of hunting healthy males? is reducing success in reproduction. I think that's an interesting idea because obviously um, when CPW wants to improve the population, they, they shift 
to bull elk from cow elk, and they think that's going to help. And I don't think it's as simple as that. I think you may have a point there that, that doesn't work the way they think it does. Uh, but uh, I actually have done, the, done analysis that included looking at those things, and that doesn't really have a strong predictive ability. And that's in part because this is a very particular area. Um, it's, a, you know, it's, it's not a large study, so it might make a difference on a macro level, but on the level that we can see here, it's not showing up. But I, it's, it's the kind of thing that's worth investigating, for sure. So I just want to re, I should have started this way. Um, it's very important that we ask questions, and I'm going to cut you off if you start telling stories or having comments. <laughs> so just putting I'm that out I'm happy to listen to stories afterwards. and comments afterwards. Okay. Sorry, I actually wanted to, to clarify a little something. DPW uh, routinely uh, limit. Okay, well, and it wasn't a question. It was, I just wanted yeah. to clarify. They limit the numbers by the cow tags, not yeah. by the bull. Right. So. Yeah, that, that, is, that, is, that is the usual method. You're right. I'm going to try to go from side to side, from men to women. No, I, I actually appreciate um, that clarification. I tried to skim through your study before I came, but I God bless pretty you. much um, gave up on it. It was way over my head. It's, it's, but, kind of, it's almost over my head, so yeah, don't feel bad. When I, I did keep skimming, and I thought that you made a reference to the number of hunters in the wood being more relevant than the number of success in the hunt, like yes. just the presence of the person caused that's, more impact. That's exactly right, and, that, and that's what leads me to think, um, you know, there's a certain number of hunters, there are vastly more recreationalists, and what is the effect of all of them? And we unfortunately don't have the data to figure that out yet. I'm hoping that we're going to start getting more data. Um, in the last year plus, there was a sizable chunk of ground that went from private ownership to public ownership by BLM. And it was subject to quite a lengthy public input process. And I, I work on a private nonprofit organization. And one of the recommendations that we made was uh, the area has elk production and uh, has, is subject to winter closure. But one of the recommendations we made was because of the production area in there that it should be closed to hunting. And CPW and BLM, they're biologists, and I, I'm sure, okay. So, so the question was, by allowing hunting in there, and CPW obviously has a motivation for that, um, is, it, it'd be difficult for you to answer that, but it seemed counterintuitive to us to say we're managing for wildlife, yeah, and so I, I, managing I, for wildlife, but they allow hunting. Right. Does that I, make I, sense I, to you? I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, so I think the question boils down to is uh, if you don't, if you're opening uh, production areas, calving areas to hunting, uh, even if you're closing them, sometimes if you're like, is that really helping? Is, is that really make any sense? Um, I think it does. Uh, I don't think it's cut and dried. Um, hunting season and calving season are opposite times of year. Um, so having it closed then, even though you allow hunting at other times, definitely has value. It would be worth doing research if, um, because there's hunting there, elk will avoid it even during calving season. I'm not aware of that research being done. It might have been. Um, but there is a supportable uh, basis for what they're doing. Um, it might be wrong, but it's not irrational, is what I'd say. Um, two things I'd like to know if you consider, number one, the real high counts of elk. Was that the off thing, and they're going back to norm? And the other thing is, have you considered how hunting has changed over this period of time? They're not out there with horses and they're carrying their guns around. They're on huge ATVs and zooming around. Excellent questions. Um, and actually, the second one, I'll, I'll take that one first, because I was just discussing that at lunch today. Uh, I think hunters, as we uh, at least used to think of them, they go out there, they spend a lot of the time on foot or on horseback. They work to get where they go. Um, they spread out. Uh, now I think we see, um, while some hunters still do it that way, a lot of hunters, you know, they're here out of state for a short time, they get on their ATV, they ride to the best hunting area they can get to on their ATV, um, they, they, they concentrate there, and then they ride out. And that's a whole different range of effects possible. Pro probably worse effects, but definitely different. Um, so yeah, I also did think about uh, maybe those, 
those uh, 10 years there of the really high population, actually that's the outlier. Um, and I think the answer is it's not because if the population could stay there for that long, um, clearly the land can support that kind of population. Now, that was probably a little high, but certainly a lot higher than the 10,000 between the two valleys it's at now. Um, and sort of looking at the, the population records from earlier weren't conducted the same way, so you can't compare them analytically. But definitely there have been t uh, times in the past with higher populations. And obviously if you go back to pre-human development, much higher. Good questions. Oh. Oh, got one, okay. I'd just like to say that uh, wolves eat elk. <laughs> that's not a question. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a discussion for another time. Question or comment? Of all three of you, who's got a question? Mine's a little bit related to the last comment, and that is, who do we believe? <laughs> just in the same, uh, in this week's local paper, was an article about people, proponents for aspen forests, and they're in decline because there are too many elk. The wolf people say there's too many elk, we need to reintroduce these predators to the region. You're saying there's not enough elk or they're in decline. Who do we believe? Well, you believe me. <laughs> that was really easy. Um, I'm not gonna touch on the wolf part of the equation because that's actually really complicated and everything you hear about, like the results at Yellowstone, are oversimplified, and we can't talk about it in this, in this short a time. But I w will say is, I just heard recently, I'm actually due to contact um, an Aspen researcher, because this, this guy found, he, I, think he, I think he, I'm not sure if he's around here, but he found that he didn't find the relationship he thought he would find between elk population and the health of Aspen. He was, because that's the received wisdom. He found that that wasn't exactly the case, and he wants to know why, and I want to talk to him about that. Yeah. Well, I, I'm waiting to hear um, the, the statistics uh, for this year. Um, they're doing the flights now uh, to, to do the counts, and they'll have that analyzed in March. So I am very interested to see what that's going to show. Awesome. So it's 7.15, and I think we're going to cut it off here and just say thank you all for coming. There's a full schedule for next week's and the rest of the weeks on the table back there, and all your tea bags are compostable. So please put them in that green trash can. Thank you, Paul. Oh, thank you.